Salford, Greater Manchester, a city proud of its heritage. And tonight, the setting for a remarkable political debate. In the closest general election in decades, seven party leaders go face to face live in the ITV Leaders Debate. I'm Julie Etchingham. Here in the studio tonight are seven party leaders with different visions for the future of our country. Over the next two hours, they'll debate head to head in front of our studio audience here tonight. And tonight will be about some of the biggest issues facing Britain, questions at the heart of this election. The main parties in England, Scotland and Wales are all represented here this evening. The leaders are Natalie Bennett of the Green Party, Nick Clegg, Liberal Democrats, Nigel Farage of the UK Independence Party, Ed Miliband, Labour, Leanne Wood of Plaid Cymru, the Party of Wales, Nicola Sturgeon of the Scottish National Party, and David Cameron for the Conservatives. Well, our questions are going to focus on some of the big political issues that we all care about and that affect everyday life. You can get instant analysis of the debate online by going to our website. And if you want to comment, the Twitter hashtag is Leaders Debate. The leaders' positions in the studio and the order in which they make their opening and closing statements, as well as answer questions, has been decided by drawing lots. First, Natalie Bennett, your opening statement. You were told that austerity and inequality, bankers' bonuses and tuition fees were inevitable. They were not. You all deserve better. Let's put principles and values first. That's why I got into politics. The Green Party is determined to deliver a fair economy that does not make the poor and disadvantaged pay for the errors and fraud of the bankers. We're committed to returning the NHS to its founding principles. No public money going into private profits. We know we must take real action on climate change, the biggest threat facing us all. Other parties trade in fear, fear of immigrants, demonising people on benefits. But to build a decent, humane society, we start with hope. Vote for change, vote green. Natalie Bennett, thank you. And now we go to Nigel Farage. There are six other party leaders on this platform tonight. They may all look different, but actually on some of the big issues that affect this country, they're very much the same. All six of them support Britain's membership of the European Union and most of our laws being made somewhere else. And as a consequence of that, all of them support open-door immigration. Is it any wonder that trust in politics has broken down to the extent that it has? Well, I represent UKIP, and we believe in Britain, and we believe this country should be a self-governing nation. We believe we're good enough to do that. And we also believe that open-door immigration has depressed the wages for ordinary people, made buying houses for youngsters very difficult, made it tough to get a GP appointment, and not been good for this country. We have a positive alternative. Let's have a trade deal with Europe, let's cooperate with them as friends, but make our own laws. And let's take back control of our borders and put in place an Australian-style point system so we can choose the quantity and quality of who comes to Britain. By doing that, we'll give ordinary working people an even break. Nick Clegg. I think it's pretty obvious that no one standing here is going to win this election outright. So you're going to have to choose, like you did last time, who's going to have to work with whom. Now, look, I'm not going to pretend that everything's perfect, though the country is in a lot better shape now than it was five years ago. I'm not even going to pretend that I haven't made mistakes. I have, I put my hands up when I have, and I've learned from them. But what you will get from me and from the Liberal Democrats is this the grit and the resilience to finish the job of balancing the books and doing so fairly. I will always act responsibly. I'll never let anyone else 
uh, borrow money that we don't have and jeopardise your risks, your jobs and our economy. And above all, I will always act fairly. I won't let anyone else impose ideological cuts on your hospitals and your schools. And I will always serve the whole of our country, not just parts of our country, the whole of our wonderful United Kingdom. Nicholas Sturgeon. This election is a chance to change the Westminster system so that it serves you better. The SNP will always stand up for Scotland's best interests. We will make Scotland's voice heard. But I know that it's not just people in Scotland who feel let down by Westminster politics. That's why my message to people watching in England, Wales and Northern Ireland is one of friendship. I won't pretend I don't want Scotland to be independent. I do. But as long as Scotland remains part of the Westminster system, the SNP will seek to work with others of like mind across the UK to deliver positive change. Like many of you, we want an alternative to the pain of austerity, an end to the bedroom tax, a halt to the privatisation of the NHS. And we believe the scarce resources of our country should be invested in the future of our children, not in new nuclear weapons. A vote for the SNP is a vote to make Scotland's voice heard, but ours will also be a voice for new, better and progressive politics at Westminster for all of us. David Cameron. Five years ago, this country was on the brink. We had millions of people unemployed and we had one of the biggest budget deficits anywhere in the world. For the last five years, we've been working with the British people through a long-term economic plan. And that plan is working. There are almost two million more people in work. It's a balanced plan, so we've invested our, in our NHS as well as reducing the deficit. And we've cut taxes for 30 million working people. And the plan's working because last year we had the fastest growing economy of any of the major Western countries. Now tonight, you're going to hear a lot of people claiming a lot of things. But please remember, these are the same people who claimed that if we followed our plan, unemployment would go up, that the deficit wouldn't come down, the economy wouldn't grow, that public services would be destroyed. They were wrong then, and they're wrong now. The choice at this election is sticking with a plan that's working, or going back to the debt, taxes, borrowing and spending that got us in this mess in the first place. I say, let's not go back to square one. Britain can do so much better than that. Leanne Wood. I'm speaking to everyone back home in Wales tonight. I'm from the Rhondda, and I understand all too well the difficulties that have been faced by our communities in recent years. You tell me that jobs and services have been cut to the bone and that they can be cut no more. Plaid Cymru offers an alternative. We offer hope for a decent future for our young people for thriving, successful communities. <clears throat> in a hung parliament, <clears throat> Plaid Cymru can win for Wales, but we can only do that with your support. I'm asking you to support Plaid Cymru, the party of Wales, to make our communities in Wales as strong as they can be. Please support Plaid Cymru to make Plaid Cymru Wales' voice in Westminster. Ed Miliband. Here's what I believe. Britain succeeds when working people succeed. But that's not the way it's been over the last five years. For five years, wages haven't kept up with bills. For five years, the NHS has been going backwards. For five years, our young people have been fearing they'll have a worse life than their parents. It doesn't have to be this way. If I'm Prime Minister, I'll raise the minimum wage to £8 an hour and ban exploitative zero hours contracts so we reward hard work again in our country. If I'm Prime Minister, I'll rescue our NHS, hiring more doctors and nurses. If I'm Prime Minister, I'll build a future for all of our young people, saying to our young people, if you get the grades, you get an apprenticeship, and cutting the tuition fee from £9,000 to £6,000. And we'll cut the deficit every year and balance the books. Some people will tell you tonight, this is as good as it gets for Britain. I say Britain could do so much better than it's done over the last five years. Party leaders, thank you very much indeed for your opening statements tonight. And the format for tonight is simple. Our audience will put their questions directly to the leaders. Each will then have one minute to answer before we open things up for a free-flowing debate. And our first question tonight comes from Johnny Tudor. 
As a 17-year-old student of politics, <coughs> I would like to ask, how do each of the party leaders believe they'll be able to keep their promises of eliminating the deficit without raising certain taxes or making vast cuts to vital public services? Johnny, thank you very much indeed. Nick Clegg. Johnny, I think it's all about balance, isn't it? Um, that's why I don't think that uh, you should be faced, Johnny, with the stark choice of either cutting too much, uh, George Osborne and David Cameron's plan is for £50 billion of cuts, way beyond what's needed, or borrowing too much, which is Ed, Ed Balls and Ed Miliband's plan. They want to borrow £70 billion more than is necessary. I think that's a dismal choice, cutting too much or borrowing too much. It's a balance, and it does mean, yes, you need to reduce spending, but you also need to make those with the broadest shoulders, the wealthiest, to pay a bit more through the tax system to balance the books. That's the way you can balance the books, do it fairly, also then, of course, put money into public services, perhaps most especially the NHS, which does need more money because of the fact we've got an ageing population. So the Liberal Democrat plan is a very simple one. We'll cut less than the Conservatives and we'll borrow less than Labour. Thank you very much indeed. David Cameron. Well, first of all, what I'd say is that we've got a plan which is working. We've taken three million of the lowest paid people out of tax and we've got almost two million people back into work. But I think what's absolutely crucial here is recognising that what our plan involves is balance. We're going to go on investing in the NHS every year, as we have done uh, under this government, under the last parliament. We'll go on doing that in the next parliament. We're going to find savings of one out of every hundred pounds that the government spends. And we need to do that for two more years, just as we've done for the last five years. But the alternative to that plan is actually putting up taxes, and I don't want to do that. I think that if we go back to the tax, the waste, the spending and the debt, all the things that got us into a mess in the first place, we wouldn't help working people, we'd hurt working people. That's what Labour did last time, and we mustn't let it happen again. David Cameron, thank you. Liam Wood. Under our plans, the deficit will be cut from 90 billion to 30 billion by 2020. We see no reason to put arbitrary deadlines on cutting the deficit. The austerity experiment has failed. We were told that the deficit would be eliminated within this parliament, yet debt has gone up. We faced all of these cuts, so much pain for so little gain. The banks have had a bailout. It's time now for the people to have a bailout. And it's time for us to invest in public services and job creation and to see an end to austerity and cuts. Liam Wood, thank you. Nigel Farage. Well, the question's right. How can anybody believe these promises on cutting the deficit? Because this coalition was put together to reduce the annual deficit to zero. That's why these uh, two guys got together. It is still running at 90 billion sterling every year. More remarkably, and what no one talks about, is the national debt, you know, which has been going on for hundreds of years. And in this five years, the national debt has doubled from 850 billion to 1.5 trillion. We need to make cuts, and there are some places we can start. We could easily cut 10 billion pounds a year from the foreign aid budget. We could save another 10 billion pounds a year by not paying over money to Brussels every single day. We could end vanity projects like HS2 that will only benefit a tiny number of people, thus saving by the end of this parliament four billion pounds a year. And we need to revisit the Barnet formula uh, because frankly, English and Welsh taxpayers are getting a rotten deal and we could save five billion pounds a year in doing that. There's a plan and a promise that could be kept. Nigel Farage, thank you very much indeed. Ed Miliband. Johnny, we'll cut the deficit every year. And as I said in the opening, we will balance the books but we'll do it in a fairer and better way than has been tried over the last five years. David Cameron promised to eliminate the deficit and he failed. So what we'll do is first of all, we'll have fair taxes. So we'll reverse the tax cut that he gave to millionaires, 43,000 pounds for every millionaire in Britain. Secondly, we will have common sense spending reductions. So outside key areas like education and health, spending will fall. But thirdly, we'll do something else because your living standards have fallen over the past five years, and that hasn't just been bad for working people. It's also meant that government has, hasn't had the tax revenues coming in. That's why this government failed on the deficit. So what we'll do is by boosting living standards, that's the third part of our plan, to live within our means, get the deficit down, and balance the books. It's a fair way, it's a better way for our country. 
Ed Miliband, thank you. Natalie Bennett. Well, Johnny, I think what we're offering is not cuts. We're offering the reversal of austerity, investing in your future and the future of everybody in this room. And what we've been doing in looking at the deficit is looking at this the wrong way round. We've been slashing away at essential public services. And let's really think about what austerity actually means. Probably somewhere near you, there's a children's centre or a library that's closed. Think of a worker in, say, that children's centre. She used to be providing an essential public service to your community. She used to be paying tax and national insurance. She had a modest amount of income to bring to spend in the community. Now that essential service is gone, she's on job seekers allowance and everybody is much poorer. So what we're saying is we do need to raise taxes on those who aren't currently paying, paying their share. Multinational companies in particular and rich individuals, if they pay their share in the world's sixth richest country, we can afford to have a decent society and afford to have decent public services. Natalie Bennett, thank you. Nicola Sturgeon. Well, Johnny, cutting the deficit is important. Of course it is. But economic policy shouldn't be an end in itself. It should be a means to people living better lives. And the fact is, austerity is pushing people into poverty. It's undermining our public services and it's holding back economic growth. And when economic policy is doing all of that, that policy needs to change. So I don't agree with the cuts proposed by the Tories, Labour and the Liberal Democrats. I take a different view. We should have modest spending increases over the next parliament. It will take slightly longer to eliminate the deficit completely, but the deficit would continue to fall in each year of the next parliament. But crucially, that alternative plan would mean that we had resources to invest in infrastructure and in skills and in innovation, the things we need to get our economy growing, at resources to invest in our public services and in lifting people out of poverty. That kind of alternative plan must be better than a blind commitment to austerity that doesn't take any account of the damage being done to our society. Nicola Sturgeon, thank you very much. So you've made your opening statements on the first question tonight. It's time to open the floor for you to contest one another's arguments. And Nick Clegg, perhaps you could start the debate for us Well, tonight. actually, I have a question for, for, for David Cameron, because he's just said to, to all of us that he wants to stay the course. But, of course, that's not what the Conservative Party want to do at all. Remarkably, the Conservative Party have said they're not going to ask the richest in society to make a single extra penny of contribution to balancing the books through the tax system. They want to impose ideologically driven cuts on schools. And I, you know, I just, I, when I hear the Conservatives talk about the choice between competence and chaos, just imagine, David Cameron, the chaos in people's lives, the people who in the NHS don't know whether you're going to find the money, the people who don't know whether their nursery or their college or their schools are going to close. That's why Johnny's right. You need to take a balanced approach you do need to reduce spending, but you also need to ask the richest to make a contribution. It's the only fair way of finishing Thank the you. job. Well, well Nick is wrong about our plans, because, of course, we are going to raise five billion from tax evasion and aggressive tax avoidance, as we've done in this parliament. And that's part of the balance plan that also involves putting more money into our NHS and cutting taxes You're not for working people. The very wealthy but here, the, the, the very wealthy include some of the tax avoiders and evaders. But here's the point. We've got to understand why the deficit matters and why we got here. And the problem and the real choice is with Ed Miliband, who still thinks the last Labour government didn't tax too much, borrow too much and spend too much. And if you don't understand the mistakes of the past, you can't provide the leadership for the future. Ed Miliband. I think not for the first time tonight, David Cameron's going to want to talk about the past, but he doesn't want to talk about the future. But David, you you just said that you were tackling tax avoidance. Let's look at the reality on this. You haven't acted on the tax havens. You haven't acted on the hedge funds. We've shown how you can raise over a billion pounds as part of our two and a half billion pound time to care fund for the NHS. It'll hire 20,000 more nurses, 8,000 more doctors, 5,000 more care workers and 3,000 more midwives. Now, you have to ask yourself at home, why won't David Cameron act on those hedge funds? They fund his party, he won't act. We need Thank leadership you. that will stand up and act to tackle tax avoidance. Once Cameron. again, he's wrong. Just this week, we've introduced a diverted profits tax to go after these companies that make money in Britain and don't pay tax in Britain. But here's what Ed Miliband isn't telling you. Because he doesn't support any of the spending reductions and efficiencies we've had to make, he wants to make a very big cut 
He wants to put up taxes and cut your pay, going into your monthly pay slip at the end of the month and taking your money out because he thinks he can spend that money better than you. That would be a great mistake for our country. Johnny, Johnny Nick, doesn't have well, you know, to... Just one moment, Mr. Nick Clegg. Mr. Clegg, Mr. Nick Borrow. Clegg, thank you. Nicholas Sturgeon. It's, it's really ironic, isn't it, hearing Nick Clegg and David Cameron argue when they've been hand in glove imposing austerity on the people of this country for the last five years. David said in his opening remarks that everybody apart from him had been proved wrong over the past five years. That's actually not the case. Uh, David Cameron has missed his own borrowing targets by £150 billion. His policies are pushing children into poverty. There's a million additional children estimated to be going to be living in poverty in this country by 2020. That is not right. So what I want to do, I back Ed on raising the top uh, rate of tax. I also want to see us invest in the future of our children, not in nuclear weapons. But I take a very clear view. This country cannot afford more cuts in the next parliament. We need to see spending rise but, but so that we can invest in the things that matter. Niger, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm hearing half the panel saying that we have no economic problems with debt at all, and the other half of the panel saying uh, that they've been prudent in government. Look, there's no question that spending got completely out of control under Labour, uh, and there are many that thought this coalition would bring it back under control. We have doubled the national debt in the course of the last five years. Our debt repayment is bigger than our annual defence budget, and that's with interest rates close to zero. We have a massive problem here, and it seems to me that nobody's prepared to admit that what we've done is we've maxed out the credit cards. Yes, there's growth in the economy, but actually at some point we've got a dreadful debt repayment problem. We've got to get real and we can cut budgets like foreign aid with, I think, popular public support. Let's, let's turn that to Nick Clegg. Well, I don't actually think making the poorest on the other side of the planet poorer still is necessarily the best solution to our problems. But look, it comes back to the simple issue of how do you balance the books but do it fairly. I don't believe, unlike David Cameron and George Osborne, that you do it by just letting the very richest off scot-free. Their plans don't involve a single extra contribution through the tax system. I don't equally think it is fair to do what the Labour Party wants to do, which is actually to increase borrowing. That doesn't help the future generation. Let's put that point directly. But the way Miliband. that you've done it so far, you've been balancing the books on the backs of the poor. 79,000 No, we've actually done it in a balanced way. The books aren't people. balanced. We've got thank a 90 you. billion 70, deficit. 79, I mean, what's going on here? You. Can we get thank real, you. please? The deficit's halved. 79,000 people. The thank you very much, Leah Lyant. On thank you, Ed Miliband. 30% of young people in Leanne Wood, thank you. Wrong, that are unemployed. I just want to say to people at home, you're going to hear a lot of scaremongering tonight from Nick Clegg and from David Cameron. That's because they're scared you're going to kick them out. Uh, now, look, I, I think there's a big decision for our country. David Cameron wants to double the cuts in spending next year. Mm. At home, you've got to make a decision. Is that really a balanced plan? I think that would put at risk the NHS, which has gone backwards under David Cameron. I think it's much better to have a fair plan, which says those with the broadest shoulders should bear the greatest burden, and we will make reductions in spending in order to balance the books. Thank you. Natalie Bennett. There's been two issues covered here. One is the issue of the debt. And it's worth saying that over the past 100 years, about half of it, Britain ran a higher debt-to-GDP ratio, and no one worried about it very much. Because the question you have to ask is, why are you borrowing? If you're borrowing, say, to build the new council on homes for social rent that we so desperately need, you know you're going to get a return far into the future if, as we want to, you end right to buy that asset is there for the future, for future generations. And the second point about the nature of the cuts, this has been borne overwhelmingly by the most vulnerable in this society. The bedroom tax. Two-thirds of the households affected by that have at least one disabled person in them. Independent Living Fund. 18,000 of the most disabled people, the most vulnerable people in our society, their support slashed away. We have to be a humane, fair, decent society. We have to support the most vulnerable. Natalie Bennett, thank you. David Cameron. The truth about, um, about this is we've cut the deficit in half. We need to clear the rest of it, and we'll do that in the coming years, but only if we stick to the plan and the plan that is working. But it is worth remembering as we debate cuts, you know, why did these cuts have to happen? What is the truth about cuts? Well, I've got the truth about cuts here. This is a copy of the letter that Labour left in the Treasury when we arrived in government five years ago, and it says, I'm sorry, we've run out of money. That is the truth of what happened. So when people talk about cuts, we had to make these decisions because the British economy was on the brink. People were worrying about whether we'd be able to pay our debts. And the 
br the brunt of these cuts and the changes we've made, the top 20% have paid more than the reigning 80% put together. Let me turn but to that's what happened when Labour were in power. And my fear is if they got in power, they'd do it all over again. But you've, increased, you've, increased, you. you've increased, you've increased... No, I just the Ed Miliband more in, in five here, years than they managed the in 13 minister. years. Isn't that the truth? No, we have cut the deficit. The, the amount we borrow thank every you. year has come down. Nigel Farage. Thank you. There you go again. You can't, you can't talk about the present and you can't talk about the future, so you <coughs> want to talk about the past. I think people at home will want to know what are we going to do for them in the next five years, not talking about the past. You backed our spending plans until 2008, it so happens, but let's talk about the future. Let's talk about the choices for working families in the future. How, are we going to have fairer taxes so that those with the broader shoulders bear the greatest burden? Are we going to have common sense reductions in spending or are we going to slash and burn or as, David, as, well, as David Cameron wants to do? Let me talk but, about the future. We are going to train no, 3 million more apprentices. We're going to build 200,000 houses for people to buy. We're going to keep on with this reduction in unemployment that sees 2 million more really? people in work. But thank we won't do it if we go back to the <laughs> debt, the welfare, the spending and the taxes. How does that cut David, Cameron, thank, David Cameron, thank you. David Cameron, thank you. Nigel Farrell. How does that cut the deficit? You've said what you're going to do and that's fine. The question that we started off was how can they believe your promises? You you have failed in this government to, to eliminate the deficit. That was your promise. It is running at 90 billion sterling. Tell Johnny, he'll ask the question, what are you, what are you going to cut? What I would say to Johnny is we are going to find one pound out of every hundred that the government spends and save that in each of the okay. next two years. But we've done it for five years and if we do Thank it for two you. more, combined with the extra taxes in terms of tax avoidance and tax evasion, we will eliminate the deficit. But David we'll do it Thank you. Let me put the point reaching the into working people's pockets and taking their money, which is Let what Ed Let me put Ed the Bill point on the size of the deficit to Leanne Wood. The deficit can be cut, but setting arbitrary deadlines is irresponsible. Labour have voted for more austerity. They voted for the austerity charter, which means another £30 billion worth of cuts. And in the valleys where I live, we've yet to recover from the recession before last, let alone this one. And your party, Ed, represents many areas of Wales at all different levels. Do you accept that you've failed people in Wales because we represent some of the poorest communities in the whole of the EU and your party is uh, presiding over those communities? No, no, I don't, Leanne. And let me tell you about the differences between me and David Cameron because you've raised this point and it is an important point. He refuses to have a mansion tax on the most expensive homes above £2 million to fund the NHS. Instead, he chooses to keep the bedroom tax. I'll have a mansion tax I'll also have a banker's bonus tax, but our young people back to work. I will make fair choices, much fairer choices than him, and he wants to go much further on the deficit, he wants to go much further on spending cuts, and that will mean not just that we balance the books, but go further, and that will mean a crushing impact on public I services. The question, and that's the choice for working the question for Ed Ed Thank you, Mick Wales, And our funding has been disadvantaged in Wales since 1978, when the Barnet formula was first invented. When your party was in power and had an opportunity to sort that out, you didn't do it. Thank we you. We deserve an additional £1.2 billion in Wales to take us up to parity with Scotland. If you get into government, will you give okay. £1.2 billion to Wales? Uh, Let's I'll, just bring in Nigel Farage on that, that point question. and then I'll it, come to Nicola Sturgeon. Nigel Farage. Well, you're quite right. I mean, the Welsh negotiated a very bad deal back in 1978 and the canny Scots negotiated a very good deal. Uh, but this all has to be rebalanced because, frankly, English taxpayers are a bit cheesed off with so much of their money going over Hadrian's Wall, giving people no oh. prescription charges <laughs> and no <laughs> university tuition, whilst in England they're charged. So there needs to be a rebalancing, and in the future, Scotland should receive less money per capita than it currently does. That Thank would be you. fair. Oh, the canny, right. Thank you. Can I go to Nicholas Sturgeon The, the, the canny Scots have paid more tax per head of population to the Treasury in every single year for the last 34 years. That's the reality. Uh -huh. But the question for Ed Miliband, Ed talks the language of anti-austerity, but it's only a few weeks since Ed Miliband tripped through the lobbies of the House of Commons with Nick Clegg, mm -hmm. with David Cameron, to vote for £30 billion mm -hmm. of cuts yes. over yes. the next but two years. I take a different view to that. I don't believe you can simply cut your way out of deficit. I think David Cameron has proved that. He's missed all of his borrowing targets. We need to invest and grow our way out of the deficit. We've got experts saying that austerity maybe, maybe. has held back mm. economic growth. So let's have spending 
increases, modest spending increases that allow us to invest in the things that matter. Thank you. I want to come back directly to Nicola Sturgeon. In fact, that Why was, did you vote for no, that, that, £30 that, billion pounds of cuts? That, 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 that wasn't what the vote was for. In fact, just two weeks ago, we had a vote against, against Tory authority. <laughs> your, S, your SNP MPs didn't turn up. And let me just say to you, Nicola, let me just say to you, Nicola, you've got a plan to cut £6 billion in Scotland because of fiscal autonomy plans, and you need to explain what that will mean for the people of Scotland. The reality is that SNP cuts are just the same as Tory cuts. is absolutely right. the point of the anti-austerity motion that Ed Miliband talks about. Thank you, Nicola Sturgeon is absolutely right. You have a choice in the two largest parties here between austerity heavy and austerity light. And I think we need to... We've been talking... David Cameron's been talking a lot about the jobs he's created. And let's think about the state of employment in Britain today. One in five workers, more than 20% of workers, is on less than a living wage. People have been forced into self-employment, not by choice, but because there's nothing else. 80% of people in self-employment are living in... David Cameron make much further cuts than is needed because they want to. And that's a huge difference. That is just simply wrong. What we've had is a balanced plan that's put more money into then the don't NHS. don't depart from it. It's also put uh, more burden on uh, some of the richest people through instance, uh, through having a stamp duty on expensive properties. But what I'm hearing in this debate is that whereas I want to save one out of every hundred pounds the government spends to not put up taxes, what I'm hearing is more debt and more taxes, more debt and more taxes, a lot more debt and more taxes, can some more debt and more taxes, question and David definitely Cameron. more debt and more taxes. Can I ask a direct question, David Cameron? Cameron. Approach, you're you're proposing, David, Julie, you're proposing an additional you. £12 billion pounds in welfare cuts. Where are those cuts going mm. to fall? Who is going yeah. to pay well, the price of those cuts? We found in the last Parliament, Nicola, we found £21 billion pounds of savings in welfare because everybody, knows, everybody knows that welfare was overblown and needed to be properly dealt with. Now, what is the alternative to making reductions on welfare? It is putting up taxes and cutting people's but let's, pay. Let's explain, I don't want to see no, that happen. Just, let's and explain that is what, what that means. One, one million government. people on disability benefit across the UK are going to lose £1,100 of their benefit. That's not the kind of economic plan I want. I want an economic Thank plan that gets that the deficit down Farage. but protects the well, vulnerable. As I say, I think we should reprioritise government spending. Uh, we should put the British people first um, and we should worry a bit less about propping up foreign regimes through, uh, you know, a wasted £10 billion a year on foreign aid, uh, which all of them agree to for some reason that's completely beyond me, um, and really, frankly, costing £10 billion a year net to be a member of the European Union for no trade advantage whatsoever. These are massive savings we could make, and we could actually, you know, some of the concerns about social spending and everything else, that's not where the cuts need to come. Let's stop giving foreign Thank you. money away. Thank you, Nigel Farage. Nice just, just to make it absolutely clear, we want to lift aid to 1% of GDP, <laughs> increase the aid, because we need a more secure, stable world. That means tangling, tackling hunger, tackling disease, supporting democracy and human rights. Thank that's you. what our aid should be for. Ed I, I do think we've seen the choice tonight, Julie, because... I've said I'll cut the deficit every year and we will balance the books. I've said there will have to be spending reductions outside key areas like the NHS and education. David Cameron has an extreme plan. He's failed in this parliament and wants to go much, much further. Now, I'm not going to stand on the stage tonight and, don't, and say there don't need to be difficult decisions. Cuts will have to come, but we can do it in a balanced way. We can do it in a fair way. Thank you very much indeed, party leaders, on our first question this evening. And uh, our next question tonight is on the NHS. It's an area where powers are devolved to the Scottish Parliament and to the assemblies in Wales and Northern Ireland. This debate is about the election of the Parliament at Westminster, where MPs legislate on health matters in England. And our question comes from Terry Kelly. As a 63-year-old, uh, I've grown up with the NHS and have recently retired after 30 years of working there. So you can understand I'm strongly passionate about it. My question is this. How will your party ensure long-term funding for the NHS whilst keeping it as a public service accessible to all? Thank you very much indeed, Terry. And I'll turn first to Nigel Farage. Well, Terry, like you, I care about the NHS because I've had so many scrapes in my life. I've needed it far more than most people. And I think that when it comes to emergency care, it probably is the best in the world. That doesn't mean there aren't some things that occasionally go wrong. This whole question of how we fund the health service 
with a population that's rapidly rising, with a population that is ageing, um, is a huge question. We've had a big internal debate uh, in our party about it. Uh, and we've decided the best way to do it is to run it efficiently, to run it as a public service, free at the point of access, but to recognise that there has been a 48% growth in middle management of the NHS since 1997. Uh, the Labour Party attempted to privatise large chunks of the health service. That, I also don't believe, has worked. I put an extra £3 billion in from savings to our EU contributions and I'd stop the tax on illness by ending hospital parking charges. Nigel Farage, thank you. Nicholas Sturgeon. In Scotland, we've already ended hospital parking charges. Terry, this is a really important question. The NHS is the most precious public service we've got. I was Scottish Health Secretary for five years. In Scotland, we've protected the budget of the NHS and we will always do so. We also believe passionately that the NHS should always be run as a public service, not for private profit. That's why we oppose the privatisation that is happening and in England. We oppose it in principle, but also because it poses a risk in the long term to Scotland's budget. And that's why SNP MPs in the House of Commons uh, will take the opportunity to vote against NCs to protect things that matter to all of us. But the best thing we can do for the NHS is to end austerity. You'll hear the other parties tonight talk about increasing funding, but if they try to do that within the framework of overall spending cuts, then they'll have to cut even deeper elsewhere. And anybody that tells you that cutting the social care budget or the welfare budget is good for the NHS is wrong. Let's lift austerity, invest in the NHS, but without making deeper cuts elsewhere. Nicholas Sturgeon, thank you. Natalie Bennett. Well, Terry, I think it's really worth noting how the NHS wasn't a huge issue in the 2010 election, but it's a huge issue now. In 2010, we were well aware of the huge costs of the private finance initiative and how there was already a creeping privatisation of the NHS. But what we've seen since then, particularly with the Health and Social Care Act, has been a race towards setting up the structures for privatisation. Now, what we say in the Green Party is very simple. The profit motive should have no place in health care. We're not happy with 5% of money that's supposed to be for healthcare going in profits. We want 0% going in profits. And to make our NHS more efficient, to deal with some of its problems, what we need to do is take the whole market mechanism out of the NHS, the whole purchaser-provider split that the Select Health Select Committee in 2010 said was costing us £10 billion a year. We need to put more money in, and in the Green Party we want the free prescriptions they've got in Scotland, plus free eye care and free dental. But we need to look at the structures and say no private profit. Natalie Bennett, thank you very much indeed. Nick Clegg. Well, look, we've heard lots of warm words here about the NHS. Of course, we all love the NHS, but the NHS doesn't need warm words. It needs hard cash. And I'll give you the precise number of how much extra cash it needs. It needs £8 billion by the end of the next Parliament. That is what a man called Simon Stevens, who runs NHS England, he's independent of politics, has said it needs. Now, the Liberal Democrats have a plan about how to find that £8 billion. Unlike the Conservatives, we'll ask the richest to pay a little extra in tax for the NHS closing the reliefs, for instance, in capital gains tax. Unlike Labour, we'll also be able to put money in the NHS because we'll actually get the job done of balancing the books and then we can invest in the, uh, in the NHS. That is the way to balance the books and invest in the NHS. It means £8 billion more here, £800 million more for the NHS in Scotland and £450 million more in Wales. And my challenge to the leaders here is if you love the NHS so much, why don't you put your money where your heart is? Nick Clegg, thank you. Leanne Wood. Plaid Cymru is proud that Wales gave the world the NHS. It's probably one of the most important contributions of our modern age. And it was based on a scheme founded by people contributing together to uh, fund the health that they needed collectively. The NHS is precious and it must be defended against privatisation and the NHS in Wales faces two threats. <coughs> One, from continued austerity and cuts, uh, but two, from centralisation under Labour in Wales. Plaid Cymru wants to recruit and attract an additional thousand doctors into the Welsh NHS to bring us up to the same level as the rest of the UK. At the moment, we're way behind. We have fewer doctors per head of the population than the vast majority of countries in the EU. The NHS needs to be funded through general taxation. Liam Wood, thank you. Ed Miliband. Terry, like so many people around the country, I'm deeply concerned about what I see happening 
in our National Health Service because we see people waiting longer for their test results, longer in A&E, longer to see a GP, longer to have an operation. We've got to turn it around. And when you hear from us leaders tonight, I think at home you should ask, where specifically is the money coming from? I'll tell you. We're going to have a mansion tax on the most expensive homes above £2 million. That's a clear promise from us. We're going to get money from those hedge funds who are engaging in tax avoidance, and we're going to get money from the tobacco companies for a £2.5 billion time to care fund. That will hire 20,000 more nurses, 8,000 more doctors, 5,000 more care workers, and 3,000 more midwives. And it's not just more staff, because it's also joining up services from home to hospital, taking on the biggest challenge our NHS faces, which is an ageing population. Because if people can't get in to see their GP or can't be looked after at home, they end up in A&E. It's a plan to turn the NHS round. Ed Miliband, thank you. David Cameron. Well, first of all, thank you, Terry, for your incredible service to the NHS. And you're absolutely right. This is the most important national institution and national public service that we have. And I'll never forget, as a dad of a desperately disabled child, what I got every night when I took him to hospital, worrying about his health. I got unbelievable care. And I just want that for every family and for everyone in our country. Now, we've been talking about the difficult decisions we had to make to turn the economy around. But a difficult decision we made also was to go on funding the NHS, putting more money in every year, and we go on doing that in the next parliament. That meant that we've trained 7,000 more nurses, we've got 9,000 more doctors, and we also managed to take out of the NHS 20,000 bureaucrats, because I want the money spent on patient care. Now, it's key that we keep a strong economy in order to fund a strong NHS. And I want to see the NHS move to a much more seven-day operation, like your GP being open, eight in the morning, eight in the evening, all the way through the week. There's one point I want to end on. There's only one group of politicians anywhere in this United Kingdom who've cut the NHS in the last five years, and that was the Labour Party in Wales. So when you hear Ed Miliband's promises, think about that. Thank you very much indeed, party leaders, for your opening comments on that question. I'm going to turn to Nigel Farage to open the debate. Yeah, I just wonder what everybody thinks about health tourism. Um, uh, Leanne made the point that it was christened the National Health Service, uh, but as we now have um, a lot of people coming into Britain and using the National Health Service who are not British residents, that is estimated to cost about £2 billion a year. I just wonder, uh, would the panel agree with me that actually it needs to be the National Health Service, and wouldn't it be a sensible thing if, like every other country, sensible country in the world, we said to foreign workers who come to Britain, you must have health insurance when you come here. Thank you. Let me bring in Natalie Bennett. You were shaking your head there. Um, absolutely not. The figures on health tourism and indeed benefit tourism that Nigel Farage is often citing, you know, they do not reflect the reality. <coughs> the situation is that people come here as immigrants to work or they come here to seek asylum as refugees. And we've had a really dangerous damaging debate about immigration, fuelled, you know, where it's been fuelled from, but sadly followed by the others. You know, we need to look at the fact that our NHS is hugely dependent on foreign-born workers. It couldn't operate without them. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Natalie Bennett. Let's just uh, remind ourselves of the question, how will your party secure yeah. the long-term funding of the NHS while keeping it a public service available to all, Ed Miliband? Nigel, of course we have to look at those issues and Can deal I with those issues, but I really don't believe that that is at the root of all of the problems of the National Health Service. And I want to pick up on something David Cameron said, because he said he protected the NHS. I ask you at home to, to decide whether this is what protection looks like. A million people waited last year in A&E for more than four hours. We've got ambulances queuing outside our accident and emergency units. We're missing the targets for cancer treatment for the first time ever. And to add to that, we had a tent, a tent erected in a hospital car park to treat people in 2015 uh, in our United Kingdom. I do not believe that is protecting the NHS and his spending plans for the next parliament are even more dangerous for our National Health David Service. David Cameron. Well, first of all, let's just take the one example of cancer. What we're seeing with cancer under this government is 460,000 more people a year getting seen and getting examined for cancer than used to happen. Our survival rates for cancer that used to be some of the worst in Europe are now actually some of the best in Europe. We are changing the NHS and we're improving it. But a strong NHS needs a strong economy. If we go back to Labour's plans for taxes and debt and spending and welfare, the economy will be wrecked and that will wreck the NHS. And this point about... The commitments we made is important because when I said we'd fund the NHS more every year, 
The Labour view was that was irresponsible. The Liberal Democrat view was that wasn't the right approach. And Labour cut the NHS in Wales, where the outcomes are worse. David, so we talk about David, your work David, David, on the NHS. Thank you, Ed Just for a moment, thank you. Nick Clegg. Uh, may I just, I mean, Terry asked how are we going to safeguard the NHS for future generations? And in view, as Terry and we all know, of an ageing population. The NHS is under greater pressure than, it, it, it is, uh, than ever before. But there's a simple question. Who has got the plan to put £8 billion of additional money into the NHS? That is what all of us standing here have been told it requires. You're not going to get it in Scotland. The SNP have actually reduced the amount of money compared Rubbish. to what we've done in, in, uh, in south of the border. And you're only going to get it if you're going to ask the wealthiest to pay a small additional contribution. One other thing I'd like to say, mental health has for far too long been the poor cousin of physical health in the NHS. The more we can do to treat mental health in the same way that we've long treated physical health, I think that'll put the NHS in, in, a, in good shape for the future. Nicola Sturgeon. Well, the NHS budget in Scotland has increased by £3 billion since the SNP Less took office. Here. It will go up by £400 million next year. You know, look, I, I think, well, one of the things we've learned is that there's not anything that Nigel Farage won't blame on foreigners. Uh, actually, the mm. pressures on our health service, many of them are things that we should celebrate. People are living longer. We've got new treatments, new technologies. How do we deal with that to protect it for future generations? First, we've got to reform. As of yesterday in Scotland, health and social care services are integrated and yes we've got to invest I think it's right to accept the Stevens report but Nick Clegg's eight billion pounds figure is an England Thank only you. figure that would be nine and a half billion pounds for the whole UK and if you follow the plan I'm putting forward of modest fiscally responsible spending increases we can <coughs> invest more in the health service but we can do that without cutting welfare Thank and you. social Thank you, Nicholas Sturgeon, yeah. Leanne Wood. Health has been used as a political football by Labour and the Conservatives in order to try to score points off each other in, uh, ahead of the general election. And the people that suffer most when that happens are the patients and the staff in the Welsh NHS. Now, there are problems in health in England and in Wales, and my view is that those problems are exacerbated by cuts to social services, but they're also exacerbated by privatisation. And it was the Labour Party that began the process of privatisation in the health service. They introduced PFI schemes and they introduced foundation hospitals as well. And my view is that the private sector has no role in a public okay. health service. Ed I'll just say on this, Leanne, my, my two sons were born in a PFI hospital. Uh, it was an old falling down hospital. But you're right, there need to be limits to privatisation. That's why we said we'll roll back the tide of privatisation that is starting under David Cameron and is about to go much, much further. We'll cap the profits of the private sector. But I do want to come back Gilly, to David Cameron. He, he, said he's, he said he's protected the NHS and he said he kept, he kept his word. David, you made a whole series of promises at the last general election to people. You said no top-down reorganisation. You didn't listen to the staff, and that's exactly what happened. You said no going back to the days when people had to wait hours on end in A&E. That's exactly what happened. I don't think people will take seriously your promises on the NHS because you broke all the promises you made at the last general David election. Let me tell Ed Miliband what we did. We took 20,000 bureaucrats out of the NHS and put 9,000 doctors and 7,000 nurses in. Now, he opposes those reforms. Presumably, he'd like to rehire the bureaucrats. I want doctors with stethoscopes, not bureaucrats with clipboards. But let me answer Terry very directly about the things we can really do to make a difference with our NHS. Dementia is a silent crisis in our country. <laughs> We're raising uh, the diagnostic rates, diagnosis rates. We need to keep going with that. This point about a seven-day operation is really important. Just a few miles down the road from where we are tonight is the Salford Royal Hospital. They carry out operations and scans and treatments on Saturday and Sunday as much as they do Monday to Friday. And as a result, they provide a fantastic service. So we can improve our NHS if we improve the way it works and go after the things like dementia, like public health, like some of the big public health challenges that put so much pressure onto our NHS. Natalie Bennett. David Cameron, since you're talking numbers, let's look at the £6 billion that last year went to the private health firms. Now, the end is absolutely right. This privatisation is causing huge damage. And what we're doing is actually racing towards the American healthcare system a system that uses twice the percentage of GDP that we use on healthcare for actual worse outcomes. And just one more point that I really want to pick up is we also need to think about the nature of our society. And if we're going to take pressure off the NHS, we need a healthier society, deal with air pollution, encourage Please. walking and cycling, Thank you. take the stress off people. Natalie Bennett, Nick Clegg. 
on the well, markets in the NHS? Well, look, it is just simply not the case. It's just simply not true that there's been some great push towards privatisation. Oh. It is simply not the case. Well, what? you could assert otherwise. No. What? Actually, I'll tell you. Well, let me give you a statistic. You legislated let, to allow 49% of your beds to be privatised. legislated uh, to outlaw. Thank you, Nicola Sturgeon. Legislated to outlaw the sweetheart deals which were mm. entered into in mm. with the private sector mm. by the Labour government, mm. as it happened. I'm not defending that. Uh, when we took over <laughs> five years ago, the total amount of NHS. NHS money devoted to the private sector was 4%. It is now 6%. I don't call that a great sweeping act of privatisation. But all I would say is it needs the money, 8 billion. We need to prioritise mental health and we need to bring social care and health care together because we have too many elderly folk in hospital beds who should be discharged from hospital but you, don't have a place to go. Thank you. Nigel Farage. My challenge to everybody here was, of course, uh, ignored and brushed aside <laughs> for chiefly politically right correct reasons. <laughs> uh, Terry wants to know where the money's coming from. And yes, you've got to put money in, you've got to stop money being wasted. I mentioned health tourism. OK, here's a fact. And I'm sure the other people will be mortified that I dare to talk about it. There are 7,000 diagnoses in this country every year for people who are HIV positive, which is not a good place for any of them to be, I know. But 60% of them are not British nationals. You can come into Britain from anywhere in the world and get diagnosed with HIV and get the retroviral drugs that cost up to £25,000 per year per patient. I know there are some horrible things happening in many parts of the world, but what we need to do is to put the National Health Service there for British people and families who in many cases have paid into this system for decades. Thank you. Leanne Wood. This kind of scam under in no, it's scam a fact. rhetoric it's a fact. is dangerous. It's, a fact. it's dangerous, it divides well, it's communities true. and it creates <laughs> stigma to people who are ill. And I think you no, would be ashamed of yourself. Well, I'm sorry, we've got to put our own people first. <laughs> I mean, would you, would you, Leanne, would you, Leanne, open it up to 17,000 people, 27,000 people? Do, I mean, the question is, how do we fund the NHS? And if, we're, if, if uh, up to £2 billion a year is being lost on health tourism, surely that is a very real problem. Thank you. You know, Nicholas Sturgeon. When, when somebody is diagnosed with a dreadful illness, my instinct is to view them as a human being, mm. not consider mm. what country they come from. Exactly. But I want to go back to something Ed Miliband said earlier on. He said there should be limits on the privatisation of the National Health Service. I'm sorry, Ed, I take a very different view. There should be no privatisation of the health service. Mm. Our National Health Service is far too precious to give it up for private profit. And to Nick Clegg, you legislated to allow 49% of hospital beds to be used by the private sector. Okay, so my, my message to people in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, if there are SNP MPs in the House of Commons after the election and you want to roll back the tide of privatisation, we will be your Nicholas ally Sturgeon, in doing thank that. You. Briefly to Nick Clegg and then to Ed Miliband. Well, as I say, um, five years ago, we inherited a situation where the previous Labour government had wasted £250 million, you can't deny this, Ed Miliband, on sweetheart deals with private sector contractors in the NHS, which didn't help a single NHS patient. We outlawed that use of public money for private sector co for, for contracts which were only based on price rather than quality. And as I said earlier, 4% under Labour was already devoted to the private Thank sector. It's only 6% now. Nick, it is simply not the case Nick, you to supported... allege that privatisation has happened in an unbridled fashion since this government <clears throat> came into power. You supported the health, health and Social Care Act, which is a recipe for privatisation in our NHS, but there's a bigger issue for people at home. And that's future plans for the NHS. I've set out where the money's coming from. David Cameron is planning to double the spending cuts next year and bigger cuts in the next three years. Think what that would mean, not just for the NHS, but social care. If you cut social care dramatically, as has happened in this parliament, you undermine the NHS fundamentally. Because elderly people don't get the help in their own home, they end up in hospital, and the NHS is creaking at the seams. That is what is happening now. Imagine what it would be like with another five years of David Cameron. David Cameron. Ed Miliband is scaremongering, and he said in, in an interview that he wanted to weaponise the NHS. Now, for most of us, the NHS is a service for our families, not a political weapon. And I think, let's be clear about social care. We are starting Starting, it started on the 1st of April, a new fund, the Better Care Fund, with £5.3 billion in, bringing health and social care together so we can unblock those hospital beds, make sure that people get the care they need in the community. But Nick was talking about the inheritance we had. There was something else we inherited in the NHS, which was a culture too often from Labour of cover-up. Just 60 miles from where we are, 
is the Mid Staffords Hospital. And we all remember what we uncovered with that public inquiry, that elderly people were being left uh, un uncared for, some of them drinking out of water vases because they weren't being looked after, because the target culture had run rampant. We've changed that, and we've made sure there are more nurses on wards, more doctors in charge, and standards of care are going up in our NHS. But don't you think cuts to social services make that situation even worse, put even more people at risk, because you've got fewer social I, workers I, it's very important. inspecting I, homes. Leanne, I agree. It's very important we fund social Nick care properly. Well, what we're doing with the social we care need, fund. I, I would suggest from this discussion we need three things to safeguard the NHS, which was Terry's original question. First, money, the £8 billion. My party has a plan to do so. Secondly, give mental health the same importance and emphasis in the NHS as traditionally given to physical health. And thirdly, make sure that where people, particularly elderly patients, are discharged from hospital, the social care system has a place for them to go. If Why we do those three things, we will protect before. the NHS Thank for the future. Why let's let's pick up on the point so that David before. Cameron made about cover up. Ed Miliband. Well, look, I would say to everybody at home that use your vote at this election as a weapon to fight for the future of our National Health Service because it needs to be rescued from you, David. What about mid because, staffs? Because look, I've got to say, over, over 13 years, the Labour government transformed an NHS from 18-month waiting to 18-week waiting. That's our record, and now it's going backwards under you. You've failed the British people. You've broken your bond of trust on the National Health Service. They believed you. They believed you. you they believed you were another kind of conservative, and it's gone backwards on your watch, and they won't trust you again. Well, you Cameron, Edmund Dave Band is Cameron, simply wrong on the figures. There are more nurses, more doctors, more people being treated, and that's because we have a strong economy. He talks about failure. Let's remember the failure of the last Labour government that virtually bankrupted this country and left us with impossibly difficult decisions. But the biggest decision we made was to protect the NHS and to spend more every year, a decision that Labour at the time said was irresponsible. That's what, that's what they said. We ignored that and we went ahead and invested in our NHS as part of a balanced plan for our country. Ed Miliband. Well, look, people at home will have to decide. I think the NHS is a foundation for working families in, their, in our country. That's why my plan says it's only when working people succeed that Britain succeeds. David Cameron wants to tell you it's all got a lot better. He wants to congratulate himself, pat him himself on the back, say he's done a great job. You've got to decide about what your experience is and what you see in the NHS. Ed Miller, I think people you. will conclude the NHS is going backwards and is not safe in his hands. Thank you, Natalie Bennett. I think David Cameron raised the issue of, of social care. And this is a really cr critically important one that has huge impacts on the NHS, but is important in its own right. Help the Age says there's 2 million people aged over 65 who need social care. 800,000 of them are not getting any help at all. And it's worth thinking for a second about what social care actually is. You might need help getting out of bed and bathing in the morning. You might need help eating. You might need help you know, just living your life. And you're not getting that help you need. And that's why the Green Party is calling for free social care for the over 65s to be provided to everybody who needs it. Thank you. Natalie Bennett, David Cameron. There's the point about the 5.3 billion fund that will help fund this vital social care that Natalie is talking about. But I also want to say how important I think it is that we have a seven day NHS with your GP being open eight in the morning, eight in the evening, seven days a week, because the areas of the country where that's already happening, some of them here in Greater Manchester, we're seeing a lot less pressure on hospitals because people can get to see their GPs when they want. Now, all of this has taken the extra resources that we put into the NHS because the long-term economic plan is working. David, you promised seven-day waiting in your last Thank manifesto you. and you well, failed to deliver it. Thank you very much very indeed, party because leaders. It we've uh, come to the end of the debate on the issue of the NHS. Thank you very much indeed all of you for that. We're going to take a short break now. When we come back, the issue will be immigration, so please do stay with us for that. Tonight, seven party leaders are debating the big issues of the election campaign live here in Salford. Later in the campaign, there will be debates produced by STV in Scotland, by ITV Cymru Wales, and in Northern Ireland, a UTV debate involving the five distinct and separate major parties there. Viewers elsewhere in the UK will also be able to see the UTV debate. Time now, though, for our third question, which comes from 
Joan Richards. Hi. Um, as a part of Europe, immigration is inevitable. If you were elected, how would you address the issue of immigration? Joan, thank you very much indeed for that. Ed Miliband. Joan, thank you for your question. I I've changed Labour's approach on immigration because I don't think it's prejudice to worry about immigration. I think people's concerns are real and they've got to be dealt with. And I want to explain how we'll deal with them. If I'm elected as Prime Minister, we'll put in place new rules which say that if you come to this country, you won't get benefits for at, le at least the first two years. And we'll also do something else, which I think is of a concern to many people in our country. We'll stop the undercutting of wages and conditions that happen so often. Uh, employers exploiting migrant labour, not paying the minimum wage, recruiting only from abroad to undercut wages. There have been just two prosecutions for failure to pay the minimum wage in the last five years. We've got to deal with it, and if I'm Prime Minister, I will. There's one other thing I'll say to you, though. If you want a party that will cut Britain off from the rest of the world, that's not me. I believe we've got to play our role in the world. But if you want a party with controls on immigration, that's what I offer. Ed Miliband, thank you very much indeed. Leanne Wood. Plaid Cymru won't go along with the scapegoating of migrants. It was not Polish care workers or Estonian bar workers who caused this economic crisis. It was bankers. And we shouldn't allow the rhetoric that blames immigrants for all of our ills. There's a reason why there's a strong anti-immigration feeling in areas where there is little immigration, and that's because often those areas have not shared in the wealth that has been uh, generated. There are gaps in the Welsh economy and there are certain skills that we need, but sadly the debate around immigration has stopped those gaps being filled. We talked earlier on about the Welsh NHS. We have fewer doctors per head of the population in Wales than other parts of the EU. And this immigration debate has not helped that problem. It's exacerbated it. Leanne Wood, thank you. Nicola Sturgeon. Well, Joan, we do need strong and effective controls on immigration. We need to make sure people don't get away with abusing the systems that the rest of us pay for. Uh, we also need to recognise that in parts of the UK there are a strain on housing and public services. I take the view though that the answer to that is investing more in homes mm -hmm. and in our public services and in enforcing a decent minimum wage, not in scapegoating immigrants. Um, I think the views of the Westminster parties on this issue have been driven by the fear of UKIP rather than by rational debate. And I think we need to have a balanced debate. So here's some facts that we need to bear in mind. EU immigrants are net contributors to UK public finances. The majority of migrants work. A majority of those who don't work are students. And let's also not forget that hundreds of thousands of British citizens go to live in other countries. How would we feel if they were spoken about or treated in the way that migrants often are here? So let's have a debate, let's not duck the issues, but let's make sure it's a decent and a civilised debate, not one that's driven by the intolerance of Nigel Farage. Nicholas Sturgeon, thank you. David Cameron. Well, thank you, Joan, for your question. What we need in our country is to recognise that people who come here and work hard and contribute to our companies and to our communities, they help make this a great country. But we do need immigration that's controlled and fair. And in recent decades, it has been too high, and I want to see it come down. Now, we have reduced immigration from outside the EU, not least by putting in place a cap on people coming to work here, but inside the EU, not least because we've created more jobs than the rest of the European Union put together, immigration has been very high. So we need to bring that under control. And here are the proposals that I will put in place as Prime Minister. First, if you're coming from the European Union, you won't get unemployment benefit. Second, if you've been here for six months and don't have a job, you'll have to go home. Third, if you've come here and worked, you'll have to work for four years paying into the system before you get out of the system. And finally, if you leave your family at home, you won't be able to send child benefit as you can now back to your family at home. Those are fair changes that I can deliver. David Cameron, thank you. Nigel Farage. Well, Joan, I told you at the start they were all the same, that they all agreed, and they do. Uh, they all agree they should be part of the European Union. So the answer to your question is, as members of the EU, what can we do to control immigration? Let me tell you, nothing. Nothing. The Prime Minister can talk about benefits. Uh, Ed Miliband can talk about benefits. This isn't about benefits. This is about numbers. 
and we have a total open door to 10 former communist countries and to the Eurozone, where people are suffering very, very badly. I don't blame a single migrant that comes to Britain from Eastern Europe wanting to better their lot. It has depressed wages, it has led to such a crisis in housing, you know, we have to build a new house, one house every seven minutes, just to cope with current levels of immigration. We need to change our relationship with Europe to one of trade and friendship, take back control of our borders and put in place an Australian-style point system and 77% of British people want something done. Nigel Farage, thank you. Nick Clegg. Well, I will never spread fear about immigration because I think we just need to remember there's basically good immigration, there's bad immigration. And, Joan, in a bad immigration, of course, we, that needs to be stopped. That's why I've introduced new checks at the borders to bear down on illegal immigration, why I've increased the penalties against unscrupulous employers who employ people and exploit them from elsewhere, why if people now want to seek benefits, they have to learn English. But there is also good immigration. We should remain a decent, generous-hearted, open-minded nation who welcomes people who want to come here, play by the rules, pay their taxes, create jobs, help uh, in the NHS. If we turned everybody away, the NHS would collapse overnight. So I guess my approach to, to immigration can be summarised simply as this, that I want Britain to be open for business, but not open to abuse. Nick Clegg, thank you. Natalie Bennett. Well, first of all, in terms of European immigration, we celebrate the free movement of people in the EU. And as Nicola alluded to, many Britons have been able to take advantage of that to do what they want with their life. That's a real plus. But if we think about non-EU immigration, what we need is a controlled but fair and humane system. And that's not what we've got now. Just take one example, the fact that a quarter of appeals against asylum refusal, people who've often been victims of torture in their own country. These people, we've come here, we've left them for years, and then eventually say, yes, you are a refugee after all. Now, I think when people talk to me about immigration, they often say they're concerned about three things. They're concerned about low wages, crowded schools and hospitals, and housing problems. All of those are important, critical issues we need to deal with, but they're not caused by immigration. They're caused by failures of government policy. Natalie Bennett, thank you. And I'll turn to David Cameron as we open up now after all of your opening statements to the debate and perhaps pick up there on Natalie Bennett's uh, point uh, that she put across that immigration is to be celebrated. Well, we do have benefits from immigration, as I said in, in my opening statement, but I think the choice really boils down to this. Nigel is saying there's nothing you can do inside the European Union, so just give up and leave. And Ed seems to be saying he doesn't want to renegotiate anything in Europe, so just give up altogether. I say get stuck in, renegotiate, get the changes we need, and then put those in an in-out referendum to the British people by the end of 2017. I've sat around that table in Europe and negotiated for Britain. You can get things done, and I've set out what I want to get done so that we can sort out this immigration issue once and for all. But Mrs Merkel who is the real boss in Europe, as we all know, has made it perfectly clear we can, you can negotiate lots of things over the next couple of years, but you cannot renegotiate the free movement of peoples within the European Union, and that is backed up by the Commission President and the President of the European Council and the overwhelming majority of the European Parliament. <laughs> Do you accept or not that in your renegotiation, free movement is not up for discussion. I don't accept that. Nigel is basically really? saying, give up before you've begun. No, In no, fact, but... if you look at my track record on Europe, <laughs> I said, we I have the European budget. People <laughs> said it was impossible. We cut that European budget. I said, let's get out of these bailout funds where British taxpayers' money was being put into countries like Greece. People said, you'll never do that. We got out of those Greek bailout funds. So instead of giving up, let's get stuck in and negotiate. And the problem with Nigel in the end is ultimately, Nigel, you're just the back door to a Labour government, which will give us open door immigration, which is not what this country... Well, Ed, Miliband. Ed Miliband. Ed I Miliband. Mean, David, I, I'm, I'm wondering what world you live in. You, you, um, I think we all you, went you, to that. You, uh, you, you talk about your negotiating skill in Europe. You made a big stand against the president of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. You lost by 26 votes to two because you had no allies. And the problem is David Cameron has marginalised us in Europe. Now, look, I just want to be honest with people at home. There are false promises you get from David Cameron. He stood on this stage five years ago and said net migration into the tens of thousands. And he actually said, kick me out if I fail to deliver. Well, I suggest you do. Uh, but he failed on that promise and he's going to make the promise again. And there's full solutions from Nigel Farage. I've just got to be frank with people. I don't think our place lies outside the European Union. 
I think that will be a disaster for jobs. I think that will be a disaster for families and businesses. Let's change Europe so it works better for us, including on immigration, but let's not sacrifice jobs, businesses and families. Nick Clegg. I think as far as immigration in the European Union is concerned, firstly I'd say the freedom to move around the European Union should never be the same as the freedom to claim, to freedom to mm. claim benefits on the first day you arrive, no questions asked. And you have to split those two things off, and that's something that we have done. Secondly, it is a two-way street. There are almost as many Brits living elsewhere and living and working elsewhere in the European Union than there are Europeans working here. And finally, if we want to make sure that our own youngsters get the jobs that other people from elsewhere in Europe might want to get, we've got to train them up. And one of the pr things I'm most proud of over the last five years is that we've now got two million people starting new apprenticeships. It's the biggest increase in apprenticeships since the last war. And by the way, over, over half of those are women starting apprenticeships. So train up our own youngsters so that they get the jobs which they apply for here at home. Can, can uh, Nick get, makes, uh, Nick can, makes can an important point, step. which is that if you want to control immigration, there are three sides to this coin. You've got to have an education system that turns out young people that can do the jobs that our economy is creating. You've got to have a welfare system that makes sure that work always pays, and we've really helped to deliver that uh, over the last few years. And you've got to have the immigration changes that I've been talking about. It's not simply about what happens in Europe. If I think of what we inherited, we had bogus colleges that were handing out visas like visa factories. We've shut them down. We had people who could claim benefits literally on arrival when Ed Miliband was in the cabinet. We've stopped that. We had people appealing in our courts against decisions made here. We've now said you have to go home and appeal uh, from home. There are changes you can make okay. if you make this a priority. Nicholas Stash. Well, before we go any further, can I just uh, remind all of us that diversity is one of our great strengths and I can see that as a lookout uh, to this audience. Decisions on immigration should be driven by what's good for our economy. And the problem we have with the debate right now that's been driven by UKIP and Nigel Farage is that it's leading to some wrong decisions. Take one specific example. When David came to office, he abolished the post-study work visa. Now, the abolition of that is hurting our universities, making it more difficult for them to attract international students. But it also means that we deprive ourselves of the economic <coughs> contribution of young foreign students that we've helped to educate here. It makes no sense. And the last point I would make to David is if there are changes needing made in the European Union, then surely the best thing to do is to try to build alliances to make those changes, not act like a petulant schoolchild threatening to leave if you don't get your way. It's better to try to work together for that change. Liam Wood. I think um, UKIP have shown their true colours tonight. <coughs> really, all this immigration rhetoric is all about pulling out of the EU. Now, I recognise there are many problems with the EU, but Wales benefits from being a member. And I would say that if there is a referendum on the future membership of Britain into the, in the EU, then the votes should be taken separately in each of the four countries so that if we are to pull out, it only happens when all four countries agree, so that you don't just have the biggest nation pulling uh, everyone else out. out I'll, come to, I'll, come to you Thank you. I'll come to you in a moment, Natalie Bennett first, then to Nigel Farage. Well, I want to partly agree with Nicola that we need to talk about the nature of the debate, but I disagree with her that this is a debate about economics. First of all, it's a debate about human lives. And if we look at one aspect, particular aspect of our immigration policy now, you have to be, if you have a non-EU spouse or partner, you have to be earning more than £18,600 a year. Your spouse or partner's salary cannot be counted. A judge described this as unfair and unreasonable. 19,000 Britons can't live in their own country with their family because of that rule. And a challenge to David Cameron, Syrian refugees. The UN has asked us very loudly and clearly to take our share of the most vulnerable Syrian refugees. You said, no, we're not doing that, we're taking our own programme. The last figure that I saw in that, we'd taken 143 Syrian refugees. I say to you, we should be taking our fair share of those most vulnerable Syrian refugees. Let, let okay. me answer so, that. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Nigel Farage there. Debate about, a debate about human lives, Nigel yeah, Farage. Yeah, quite right. And, 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 and I was the first person to say we should take some, some of the refugees from Syria. Okay. I understand so. that. Joan's question, we've forgotten the question here. What as EU members can we do to control immigration? I've said it before, nothing. Nobody else here, even though they're pro the EU, will actually admit that. But can we get some sense of history on this? You know, if you, if you go back even to the 1990s, from 1990 up until 1998, net migration as a measure into Britain was about 40,000 a year. In the 80s, it was lower than that. In the 50s, it was slightly higher than that. The point is this, since World War II, 
we've operated with net migration into Britain at an average of about 30,000 a year. It is now net 300,000 people a year. It is 10 times anything this country has had to live with since 1945. And what it's meant is for ordinary folk on minimum wage or not very high salaries, their wages have been compressed. It, it is the ordinary people of Britain that have paid a very high price for the big corporate employers who benefited so raise the from low wage. I want to bring in Nick Clegg to this point. Well, I think the answer to that is to raise the minimum wage, which we're now doing so far, far, far faster than we ever have done before. Train up more apprenticeships, which we're doing on a scale we never have done before. But, but Nigel Farage talks about remember history. I mean, yeah. the, the Farage family were, 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 were foreigners once. Well, precisely. I'm married to a foreigner. Well, You're precise, married to a well, foreigner. Precisely. You know, but let's, well, let's be open-hearted well, and generous. We, well, should we control it? Our Let's should we know, control it? All I'm saying is... Should we control it? No, That's we the question. stop bad immigration, but don't how? paint everybody with how? the same brush. How? Well, Joan's question is, how do you control immigration as an EU member? Be honest with people. Well, what we, we can't. And what you say, tell well, them I, the truth. Well, I will tell exactly the truth, tell which the is truth. that the freedom to move around the European Union should not be the same as the freedom to claim. That's irrelevant. Yes, we, it is not it's irrelevant. irrelevant. It's not this is not about benefits, it's, it's about movement of people. But your problem is you seem to imply anyone who's foreign who comes to this country is a menace. We I simply not, can't as a country. Of the kind. We must we've remain generous spirited and open-minded to the, the rest kind. of the you world. You won't admit the truth, will you? The truth is there's nothing we can do. Admit there's it. a but crucial the, aspect of this admit debate, it. Julie, and a crucial aspect for people at home. David Cameron said earlier that work pays in our country. Rubbish. Work doesn't pay in our country. There are so many people around our country, millions of people, people watching at home tonight, who are going out doing all the hours that God sends and who can't feed their family, can't make ends meet at the end of the month. And let's take the issue of zero hours contracts because it's relevant to this debate. If work is insecure, if work doesn't pay properly, then you don't get the security that working people need. Now I say, we should deal with those exploitative zero hours contracts it is an absolutely crucial part of this immigration debate because you've got to create security for the working families of Britain and that's what I will do. Well, well let me answer these questions. First of all, to Ed Miliband, we've created two million jobs because we've got a strong and growing economy. When he was sat in the cabinet, about half a million people lost their jobs. So never mind zero hours. With Ed, there'd be zero jobs. But let me take on Nigel on this. Look, Nigel, you mm. want to leave the EU. It's a very clear position. But the only way that can happen is by having a referendum. Now, I say, stay in, fight, get a better deal, but hold that referendum. The irony of Nigel's position is if people vote for him, they end up with Miliband, and they get back. no referendum, this, no renegotiation, I want to come back. no immigration. I, I, I want to come back on no that. No this is the second time. Thank you, thank you, Nigel Farage. Thank you, David Cameron. This is the second time in this debate. Can I answer the Syria question? I want to come back I want to come back to Thank you, David Cameron. Thank you, David Cameron, and both of you. Twice in this debate. Thank you, Nigel Farage. Let's hear the point on Syria. Thank you, David. I just want to be very direct. We have taken... Uh, some people from Syria, some of the most vulnerable people, including uh, elderly and disabled people. But the most important thing we can do in Syria is maintain the fact that we are one of the biggest, I think the second largest bilateral aid donor, helping people in those refugee camps to be fed, to be housed, to be clothed, and try to find a solution so they can go home. There are about six million people, refugees are in danger of being refugees. We cannot take all those people in. So it makes sense to use our aid budget to try and help them in the region and then help them Get Thank home. you, David Cameron. On that issue of leaving Europe as a means of controlling immigration, Nicola Sturgeon. Well, Nigel Farage wants to take the UK out of Europe. I think in pandering to that, David Cameron is taking us dangerously close mm. to the exit door. I'd like to issue a challenge to David, uh, to Ed and to Nick tonight. Uh, they spent a lot of time in Scotland during the Scottish referendum talking about the UK family of nations. So will they give a commitment that if there is an in-out referendum, no one part of that family of nations will be taken out of Europe against its will? Will they give a commitment, as Leanne has suggested, that the votes will be counted in each of the four nations so that none of us can be dragged out against Admiral our will? Well, let me answer that question directly. My priority is not to have an in-out referendum, and let me explain why. <laughs> Because if, my, if my, priority, my priority as Prime Minister is to tackle the cost of living crisis, sort out our NHS and build a future for our young people. And look, you know, the British people have a decision to make tonight and at the general election. David Cameron wants to spend the next two years deciding whether to exit the European Union, something he doesn't even want to do. He says he wants to stay in the European Union. Well, so, does. look, I say 
I say there's better priorities for our country and they'll be my priorities as Prime Minister. Can we be well, clear that we would, there would not even be a discussion about a referendum if it wasn't for the rise of UKIP? In 2012, David Cameron was opposed to Britain having an EU referendum, saying it wasn't in our national interest. The only, for people out there that want a referendum, the only way it's going to happen, freely and fairly, is put enough UKIP MPs into Westminster. Nick Clegg. <laughs> Nigel Farage seems to think that every single problem in the world can be solved by a referendum on Europe. Look, at the end of the day, Europe isn't perfect. Of course it's not perfect. But it is, the, it is the world's largest marketplace of 500 million shoppers who buy our goods and buy our services. So if you do what Nigel Farage or significant parts of the Conservative Party want, which is to yank ourselves out of the family of nations that makes up the European Union, unemployment will go up. And I would never, ever, ever endorse an approach which would make our country poorer and would see more people out of work. I think it is deeply irresponsible. Natalie Bennett. Well, what I will endorse is trusting the voters and believing in the people and you have to be in your late 50s to have had a chance previously to directly vote on Europe. So the Green Party does support a referendum on Europe but we would be campaigning very strongly in that referendum to stay in Europe because we believe that Europe there's certain decisions that should be made at that kind of level like protecting our environmental standards, protecting our workers rights, those kind of decisions we need to set your continents wide standards for. But also what we need to do is have a different kind of Europe, a Europe that's much less centralised, much less arranged for the big multinational companies, much better for local communities and local decision making. Liam Wood. I think that um, the rhetoric on immigration has not helped the economic situation that we're in. There are gaps in the Welsh economy that need filling and this debate does not help. The one thing that I would agree with Nigel Farage on, and I never thought I would ever <laughs> say oh, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> this could be fun, couldn't but, it? But you are right when you say that you can't control immigration from within the EU well, as a you. member. You one have honest to, member of the panel. You well to, done. You have to accept that people will come here. We have free movement of people, and people will move out uh, to other parts of the EU as well. And we expect our citizens to be treated well when they move to other countries and likewise we must treat European citizens well when they come and live with us in our communities too. Nigel Farage. Uh, well, uh, an admission of the truth, that's <laughs> fine. I tell you, it's very interesting, Leanne, this actually worked rather well. The free movement of peoples, when we were in with countries like France, Germany, the Netherlands, roughly similar living standards, roughly similar education and health systems, it didn't really pose any problem. The problem was, irresponsibly, stupidly, we let in 10 former communist countries where the minimum wage, say in Romania, is about a tenth of what it is here. And if you say to people in poor countries they can move to relatively rich countries, they do. The Labour government, and I think Ed's admitted this, got it horrendously wrong on the figures. But, but, but we okay. now face the potential of a collapse in the Eurozone and, and we have no control over the numbers Edmund coming to Britain. Well, we did get it wrong and I've, and I, and I've said we got it wrong and I've changed our approach. But I, I do think there's a wider issue here about the opportunity for our young people. Nick and David were saying how brilliant everything is on apprenticeships. Take an issue, IT. We, import lot, we bring lots of people into this country uh, who are contributing to our country from other countries uh, on, uh, in IT, with specialist skills in IT. But apprenticeships in IT are actually falling in our country. Now, look, the answer is, we should say, that if you want to bring in a skilled worker from outside the European Union, you must provide apprenticeships to the next generation, because homegrown opportunity is an essential part Thank of you, dealing Edmund. with people's concerns about immigration. Nick Clegg. I strongly agree that apprenticeships, which is an old idea, the idea that you sort of earn and learn, that you, uh, you, you, you learn the, the tricks of the trade while you're actually working uh, on the shop floor, in the office or elsewhere, is a, is a great old idea that we've, 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 given, we've given it new life. We've got two million new apprenticeships created over the course of this last parliament. It's never been expanded on such a scale. And I think it is something that I hope all future parliaments will continue with because it is a fantastic way to allow youngsters Hi. to get their first, their feet Thank on the first rung of the jobs ladder. Thank you very much, Nick Clegg. Thank you very much indeed, all party leaders on that issue. Now, if the arguments tonight have fired your political passions, you've still got time to register to vote on May the 7th. You can do so online. Now, our next question is from Rebecca Creamer. I'm a 25-year-old graduate with a good job, but my generation as a whole have got it pretty tough. It cost us more than our parents to go to uni, we'll work well into our 70s for smaller pensions, and high rents make saving for our own home difficult, if not impossible. We'll be less well off than our parents and it feels like we're paying for other people's mistakes. 
If you're elected, what will you do for my generation to help us feel optimistic about our future? Rebecca, thank you very much indeed. Liam Wood. Plaid Cymru believes that we need to invest in our young people, particularly in education, as that is the best route out of poverty. You're right when you say that young people today are going to fare worse than the older generation. And it's the first time for, for a long while that the generation of today is going to be worse off than the generation before it. Plaid Cymru wants to provide free tuition fees for students, but because of austerity, we are not in a position to do that, even if we were running the Welsh Government. We want to keep the tuition fee subsidy that is available for Welsh students, but we would like uh, students to study in Wales so that we can invest that public money into Welsh universities. <coughs> but we would like some courses to be made available for free, and I've talked earlier on about the need for doctors in the health service in Wales, and we believe that we can uh, attract more doctors by providing free tuition for those particular skilled group of workers. Liam Wood, thank you. Ed Miliband. Rebecca, you speak for so many young people right across our country, so many young people I meet who are asking why they're paying the price of hard times. And that's what we've got to turn around. And that's what I'm going to do if I'm your Prime Minister. Look, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to guarantee all young people access to a good education. So you get a high quality apprenticeship if you get the grades. That's a guarantee the next Labour government will make. And we'll also cut the tuition fee from £9,000 to £6,000 because I don't want our young people drowning in debt when they leave university. Next, we've got to create good jobs for young people. That's why we'll ban the exploitation of zero-hours contracts. And we'll say if you do regular hours, you get a regular contract. And lastly, we'll build homes again in our country. 200,000 homes a year by 2020. And get a fair deal for young people in the private rented sector where many young people are being ripped off. I believe in the, what I call the promise of Britain, that the next generation does better than the last. I believe we can restore it. Ed Miliband, thank you. David Cameron. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for your question. I think it's absolutely crucial. I think the most important thing is to make sure there are good jobs for people to do. And obviously, in the last parliament, we've created two million new jobs. And in the next parliament, we want to create two million more good jobs for people. I think apprenticeships and universities are vital. I want our young people to have the choice of either. So we're going to have three million apprenticeships in the next parliament, but also we've uncapped university places. So whoever wants a place can go to university. In terms of building homes, I want us to build homes that people can afford to buy. And that's what our, our starter homes are all about. Put at 80% of the market price, not available to foreign buyers or uh, investment funds, but there for British people to buy and to own. And with our help to buy, that has helped about 88,000 people onto the housing ladder, we can make that a reality for people. Now, I know it seems odd to answer a question from a young person about pensions, but actually it is important to be able to look forward to security and dignity in old age. And we've safeguarded the pension because people in our country should be able to look forward to dignity and security at the end of a hard working life. David Cameron, thank you. Natalie Bennett. Well, Rebecca, we believe that education is a public good and therefore it should be paid for from general progressive taxation far more progressive than we have now. Just look at the facts on this. Students on average now are leaving university with £44,000 worth of debt. 73% of them on current figures will never pay that off. They're going through 30 years of their life, for many people from roughly their mid-20s to their mid-50s. Any time you earn any sort of money at all, you're going to be paying a significant chunk of your income to a debt that you'll never repay. And it's not like this system is actually working. On current figures, again, 45p in the pound is never going to be repaid. So we, in the Green Party, not only want zero university tuition fees, we also want to pay off student loan company debts so people don't have that weight of debt. But of course, we also need changes in housing and jobs that you can build a life on, which is why we're calling for a minimum wage of £10 an hour by 2020. Natalie Bennett, thank you. Nick Clegg. Rebecca, Rebecca, let me take the issue of tuition fees head on. I, of course, famously, infamously, couldn't uh, put into practice uh, my party's policy on tuition fees for reasons which I hope you're familiar with. They were introduced by Labour and actually jacked up by Labour and uh, there was no money left. But we did, did the next best thing, got the fairest deal possible and thankfully now there are more young people going to university than ever before on full-time courses and there are more young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. 
But if I couldn't do that, I hope, I hope some fair-minded folk would at least acknowledge many of the other things that I'm very proud I have managed to do to give more opportunities, to create a stronger economy and a fairer society. We've talked about more apprenticeships than ever before. The huge tax cuts, which mean you pay nothing, no tax, on the first £10,600 you earn uh, as of uh, next week. Uh, better mon money going to schools through the pupil premium for disadvantaged kids. Healthy meals at uh, lunchtime for little children at primary school. These are the things which make a fairer future for future generations, and I'm very, very proud of them. Nick Clegg, thank you. Nicola Sturgeon. Well, I'm the First Minister of Scotland. We're investing in record number of apprenticeships, more affordable homes, and helping the poorest young people in our country stay on at school and college. But we've also kept access to university free of tuition fees. I grew up in a working class family. I wouldn't be standing here as First Minister of Scotland without the free education I had access to. As a politician now, I have no right to take that same entitlement away from the next generation of young people. So I will always fight, work, vote, do whatever it takes to keep access to university free. I think it's shameful for any politician who has benefited from that free education to take it away from others. So SNP MPs in the House of Commons, in the Scottish Parliament, anywhere else will always support the principle that your access to education as a young person should be based entirely on your ability to learn and never ever on your ability to pay. Nicholas Sturgeon, thank you. <laughs> Nigel Farage. I think there's a section of young people in this country who are having a fantastic time. Life is great. They're full of optimism. Uh, they're the rich. They're the rich. And they're the ones who go to the 7% of schools where their parents are wealthy enough to pay for their education. And they are now dominating politics, the media, the arts, sport, in a way I haven't seen before. And their families get richer and richer. And the gap, the social inequality in Britain, grows with every single year. By abolishing grammar schools, by abolishing selective education, what we did, actually, was to pull up the ladder on tens of thousands of young men and women every year who would have done better had they gone to a grammar school. With university education, we encouraged lots of people to go to university who actually weren't academic and have come out with debt and would have done better with trade and skills. And to give optimism on housing, well, I've said earlier, we have to build a new house every seven minutes to cope with migration. Let's cut the numbers and let's have a brownfield building revolution. Nigel Farage, thank you. To open the debate, I'll turn to David Cameron. Well, let me make a point about schools, because actually, under this government, we've got a million more children in good or outstanding schools. And one of the reasons for that is we've opened up the state education system and encouraged great education providers, teachers and charities to come in and set up schools. I was at one today, the Warrington King's Academy. Three times more pupils want to go than they can take. And I think these free schools are a great institution, but Ed Miliband's party says no more and is even contemplating shutting down some of the schools that are about to get going. I say we need more good school places, and whether they're academies or free schools or but university but technical colleges, do that, if you're that is what we, that's what we need. But why, 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 is the no, to come back to, why is the Conservative Party planning to cut the money for schools? You're planning to cut th over £3 billion out of the school's budget. That is no way to guarantee fairness. And when, well, well, in, in the government that, that over the last five years, that, that, your that's party wanted to cut... Well. We've got, we've got £7 billion pounds for new primary school places. I have to say, it's, it, you know, with Nick Clegg, we sat in the Cabinet room together. We took difficult decisions together. Nick, I defend all of the decisions we took, and I think your sort of pick-and-mix approach no, really no, is no, not no. going to convince anyone. I, 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 I remember, think, I remember, I think Julie, both, I remember just, vividly just when your party wanted to cut spending divorce, for schools at the beginning of the last Parliament, and I said no, because you don't make society fairer by cutting the money that goes to nurseries, colleges and schools. I, I think they're both blaming each other, and they're both right, uh, <laughs> uh, Julie. Um, look, the, the, thing I would, uh, the thing I would say to David Cameron is, of course, his, his scares about, about free schools are wrong. We do not want a system in the future which has unqualified teachers 17,000 unqualified teachers in our schools. But look, there's a bigger issue because Rebecca, who asked the question, was about asking about young people going into the world today. And you've heard David Cameron and Nick Clegg defend a system which ensures that young people leave university with £44,000 worth of debt. He didn't have to leave school with £44,000 worth of debt, nor did he. Now, nor did I. But the difference with me is I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to cut the tuition fee. Would I like to go further than £6,000? Of course I would. But it's a costed plan to reduce the tuition fee. And, Nick, you describing a broken promise as the next best thing. I mean, I'm sure I'll remember that for the future. Uh, but, you know, 
It was a broken promise. You betrayed the young yeah, people of just, our can country. I reply, can I reply Very to that? I mean, you know, I, I get this sort of pious uh, stance from Ed Miliband. This is the man who was part of a government that said no boom and bust in the economy and crashed our economy, jeopardising the future generations and life chances of millions of people in this country. I've apologised. I've taken responsibility for the mistakes I've made. Why don't you, in front of the British people, Ed Miliband, apologise for we your role got in it, crashing... No, said... no, no, don't say. Not, nothing euphemistic. Say... I'm I'm sorry for crashing the course, British economy. Of course, that's what you did. We said we got it wrong on bank regulation. <laughs> Absolutely, we said we were sorry for what we did with, in relation to the banks, and the banks were underregulated. But, but let me just but point it's out not just there was a global, global, bank, was a global not... financial crisis. Let me just point this out, David. When you were in opposition at the time, as leader of the opposition, you were saying the banks were overregulated. So I'm really not going to take any lectures from you about the global financial crisis. Ed Miliband still thinks. He still thinks the last Labour government didn't borrow enough. Didn't spend uh, enough, didn't tax enough. I mean, that is the truth. And young people suffer the most. When you have an economy with out-of-control welfare, out-of-control debt, out-of-control spending, young people suffer the most because the deficit is, and the debt is on their no, heads. they suffer the, the most generation. when you have a Nassie Conservative Prime Minister Ed making Miliband, unfair thank you, choices. Nassie Bennett. That's why they suffer, David. Thank you. Nasli Bennett. I think we were talking about education, exactly. so perhaps we can Why go back there. Sure. And to come back to the point about education, <laughs> and particularly the point that David Cameron raised about free schools, um, we have a system brought in, supported with the academies of the former government, that were based on competition. The idea is that schools compete with each other. They fight against each other. The Green Party, we don't believe that should be the foundation of schooling. We should have cooperation. We want to bring free schools and academies back under local authority control, have an overall cooperative system. And much more than that, we need a school system that isn't focused on exams, that isn't an exam factory that shoves children through exam after exam after exam. Children need an education for life, and that means a much broader education, an education that includes things like first aid, cooking, sex and relationship education, Thank personal you. finance education. We need a much broader education that prepares our young people for Thank life. Thank you very much indeed. Liam Wood. In Wales, there will be more cuts to education. There will be a difficulty continuing the tuition fee grant beyond 2017. If Labour win, they will cut the Welsh Block Grant by 2.2%, according to the IFS. That's a billion pounds over the course of the next term, and the Tories will more than double that. So affording good education and job creation will be difficult under those circumstances. That's why we must end austerity. And if we are in a situation where there's a hung parliament, Plaid Cymru will do all it can to end austerity, to rebalance power and wealth, and to win for Wales parity with Scotland, and then we too can afford free tuition fees for students in Wales. Nicola Sturgeon. Well, I think we've seen uh, tonight from this uh, discussion why we really need to break the old boys network at Westminster, because frankly, none of these guys can be trusted when it comes to tuition fees. Nick Clegg shamefully broke his promise. But when you listen to Ed Miliband, remember that in 1997, Tony Blair promised no tuition fees and then introduced them. In 2005, he said no top-up tuition fees, and then after the election, top-up tuition fees were introduced. If you want Ed Miliband, if he does get to be Prime Minister, to keep his promise on tuition fees and on the other progressive policies that he's now promising, then I would say hope there's some SNP MPs in the House of Commons keeping him Can honest. I? Thank you very much. Let's just return to the question because yes, uh, Rebecca I, put a lot of issues into this uh, question. It wasn't just about education, yes, exactly. it was about housing yes. too. It was also about uh, possibly the younger generation paying for other people's Can, can I just talk on, on the housing point? It's a very important point because Rebecca, I'm sure, is in keeping with lots and lots of young people worried that you're not going to be able to get your feet on the first rung of the property ladder. Uh, the Liberal Democrats, we are, we've got, a, I think, a, an idea which might help Rebecca, and it is this. At the moment, lots and lots of young people can't afford the deposit to get a mortgage on a property. So what we would do is we would introduce a rent-to-own scheme where you wouldn't need to find the deposit to buy a house, but every time you rent... Uh, pay your rent at market rates, you'd build up a share of ownership in your home. So by renting, you'd become, over time, an owner in your home. I think that would be a great, great way, which we could introduce in the next Parliament, to give people like Rebecca the, 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 that tangible belief that they can hope to live in a home which they can call their own. You keep on housing. Yeah, well, I, you know, think this is about demand and supply. Markets are about demand and supply. If you're having to build a new house every seven minutes to cope with 300,000 people a year net coming into Britain, you have a problem. So that side of it, 
a government, an independent government, can deal with that and reduce the numbers coming. But we need to build lots and lots of houses. The problem is that developers want to build on green field sites. It is cheaper for them, it is better for them. Uh, and indeed, changes in the planning laws mean it's actually much easier for them to build on those sites. I think what government needs to do, and I'm, I don't always want government to intervene, but I do think here government should supply grants and actually make decontamination of brownfield sites something that is a big opportunity for developers. Thank and we could build 200,000 new houses a year on brownfield sites and solve much of this problem. Nicola Sturgeon. Well, housing is hugely, hugely important. In Scotland, as I know is the case in other parts of the UK, we're investing in schemes like help to buy, in shared equity, in taking a, a range of steps to help people, not just young people, but young people in particular, get their first uh, foot on the housing ladder. But we're also protecting affordable housing as well and investing in greater numbers of affordable homes because there are some people even with the help of shared equity will not be able uh, in the short or medium term to buy their own home and we have a duty and an obligation to make sure we're providing good quality houses for rent as well and that's really important. Thank you very much Ed Miliband. I want to pick up on something that's very important to young people which is renting in the private sector. Lots of pe young people have this experience, it's incredibly insecure, it's sometimes substandard uh, accommodation. Now we're the only party with a plan to get a fair deal in the private rented sector. Three year tenancies, not one year tenancies, uh, rent stabilised during that time and stopping letting agents charging tenants because at the moment they charge tenants and landlords fees. And that is a massive issue for young people all across our country and we will act. But it's all part of saying, look, we've got to stand up some of these powerful interests and actually make our country work for young people. Thank again. you, Ed Miliband. Let's just return to the final element of Rebecca's question. She took in an awful lot of ground with it. Mm. If you are elected, what will you do to help my generation feel optimistic about our future? David Cameron. Well, I think there is, obviously, it's been a very difficult time recovering from the appalling uh, recession that we had. It has been tough. It has been difficult. But Britain has still got some great strengths. We've got a strong and growing economy. We're creating jobs. We're part of all these important networks in the world, whether it's the G8 or NATO or the European Union. We have clout in the world. We can get things done in the world. Think of what some of our people are doing right now. We've got nurses in West Africa helping to deal with Ebola. We've got some of the most brave and professional armed services anywhere in the world. And tonight's a good moment to, to say thank you to them for all they do. We're a nation of great inventors. Like that when there's homeless people on the streets who've been in the services. Not from the audience, thank you. I, I think it's good to say... Because I'm worried that at the end of the day there's more thank of us than much there is of them. The, 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 they're not listening the, to our concerns. But the, the lady makes an important point, which is there are people who come out of our armed services who do have difficulties, and that's why we should be putting money into the armed forces charities that help homeless people and people also with mental health problems when they come out of our armed services. Thank you very much. Let's return to the issue about uh, providing optimism mm. for a younger generation. Natalie Bennett. Well, I think I made in my opening remarks reference to climate change. And that, of course, is one of the critical issues that we have to deal with to provide an optimistic future. But much broader than that, we have to stop trashing our planet. If we think about in Britain today, we're currently collectively using the resources of three planets when we've only got one. We have to rebuild and invest in our economy to deal with that. And just to think about what my generation, the kind of legacy we're leaving your generation. Thank you. World Wildlife Fund figures, just that this is really important. The fact is that in the last 40 years, in my lifetime, the world has lost 50% of its vertebrate wildlife. Thank you very much. Half of the wild animals have gone. Which Nigel Farage. Fracking that. Thank you. Uh, Can we return, please, to I the think, issue yeah. about optimism for the younger yeah. generation? Nigel Farage. It's interesting. Our own leaders aren't optimistic. Our own leaders don't think this country is good enough even to make its own laws. Uh, what I want to see is a self-governing, self-confident United Kingdom, a country in which we've got pride, and for young people, we're living in a global economy. We've got to forget this obsession with our, frankly, failing in many cases, next door neighbours in Europe, and let's re-engage with a bigger, wider world, and the best place to start would be the 2.2 billion people Thank that you. live in the Commonwealth and are our real friends. Let's have a, let's have a Britain that governs Liam itself Wood. and looks outwards to the world. Thank you. Liam the best way to provide optimism is to create the conditions whereby everyone can have a job, whereby we can create uh, the conditions of full employment. And Plaid Cymru wants to create 50,000 new jobs with our job creation plan 
by supporting small businesses through business rate relief to take on extra people and also changing the way that the public sector contracts out to the private sector to guarantee more jobs to be uh, local jobs. Thank you very much. A note of optimism for the younger generation. I think the, the, the only way we're going to instill optimism is if we wipe the slate, slate clean for the next generation. We have to release Rebecca and her generation of the, of the debt and the deficit of this generation. I don't want Rebecca, I don't want my own kids, I don't want any of our children to pay the price for this generation's mistakes. And if I can leave Rebecca and everybody with just one figure in mind, one statistic, £46 billion. That is what we as a country will spend next year just paying off the interest on our debts. Just imagine the, number, the hundreds of thousands of homes we could build for £46 billion. £46 billion is the same as £700 for every man, woman or child in this country. And that is why when I hear some leaders implying that we shouldn't somehow get rid of our deficits, I say, look, if you don't do that, it's a bit like Miriam and me saying we're not going to pay off our credit card bill and we'll get our little kids to pay it for us. It's not None fair. Of us we must that. let the future thank generation you. be relieved from this generation's mistakes. Ed Miliband. I just want to be very practical about this. What's one of the most important things for our young people? The quality of jobs. We've got 700,000 people in our country on zero hours contract. Probably some people watching tonight at home waiting for that text message to say whether you have work tomorrow. Now, David Cameron says he couldn't live on a zero hours contract. Well, nor could I, David. But the difference with me is I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to legislate. So if you do regular hours, you get a regular contract, not a zero hours contract. And it goes to what kind of country we build. Do we build a country with security for working families and for our young people? But when or they based on a, insecurity? They, they Ed, you haven't, and the problem to is, Ed against Ed, zero hour Ed, contracts the, and turn down that opportunity uh, in Wales. They voted against a plate <coughs> amendment to end zero hour contracts in the care sector. So why should people believe what you say on zero hour contracts? Thank you. But also, yeah, we, I mean, I think that yeah, makes a good point because we discussed today there are about 70 Labour MPs that employ people on zero hours contracts and they obviously haven't got to the bit about practicing where they preach but there's a bigger point here yesterday a hundred of business leaders from some of the most uh, iconic business brands large and small said that the plan that we have is getting the country back to work is getting the country on the right track and if we go off that with Ed Miliband's plan we put the country at risk the recovery at risk and jobs at risk there you have and it. for young people there you that's have the it. most important thing of there all you have it. So is zero that we have an Thank you, Ed necessary Ed for our economy to succeed. What, what, you what, don't, that's what you're saying, is the David. the zero look, jobs approach that we got under Labour. Never mind the soundbite, David. The you're defending I mean, zero hours contract. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, jobs. That's there true. is a big choice. There is a big choice at this general election. He thinks that as long as a few corporations and individuals do well, the rich is the most powerful, the wealth will trickle down to everyone else. Well, he, we tried that experiment over the last five years. Um, it's uh, failed. Party it's leaders, failed. thank this, you very much indeed for your comments on that uh, very comprehensive question from Rebecca. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our free-flowing debate. There's been a lot discussed here over the last two hours, a lot for us all to reflect upon. Before we conclude tonight, I'd like now to invite each of the leaders to make a final and brief statement on why they think you should vote for their party on May the 7th. And I'll turn first to Nicola Sturgeon. Tonight, the choice at this election has been clear. You can vote for the same old parties and get the same old politics, more cuts and more misguided priorities. Or you can vote for something different, better and more progressive. I'm going into this election with a clear message. None of us can afford more austerity. None of us can afford an additional £30 billion of cuts. And none of us can afford the £100 billion that the Tories, Labour and Liberals intend to spend on new nuclear weapons. Their priorities are wrong, but they won't pay the price. It will be ordinary people across the country who pay the price. The SNP offers an alternative, a clear alternative, a plan for investment. Yes, it is fiscally responsible, but it will also allow us to invest in infrastructure to protect our public services and to lift people out of <coughs> poverty. To people in Scotland, I say vote SNP for a louder voice for Scotland. To people elsewhere, I say ours will be a voice to help bring about change for you too. Nicola Sturgeon, thank you. Nick Clegg. <coughs> Well, thank you for sitting through this uh, two-hour uh, political marathon. I just have one more thing to ask of you, and it is this. When you vote, make sure that you decide what's right for you and your family. Make sure that you do what's right for our country. But above all, make sure that we don't lurch this way or that. Make sure that we don't 
borrow too much on the one hand or cut too much on the other. In other words, make sure that when you vote, we keep our country stable and strong and fair. And the only way we can do that is by finishing the job, finishing it fairly, balancing the books, doing it fairly, and putting money into our public services. Because that's the only way that we can create the society that I imagine we all want. A society where we have a stronger economy and a fairer society, where there is opportunity for everyone. Nick Clegg, thank you. Ed Miliband. You've heard from seven leaders tonight, but there's one fundamental choice at this election. Do we build a Britain that puts working people first, or do we carry on with a government that's not on your side? If I'm Prime Minister, I'll make sure we reward the hard work of everybody in our country, not just those who get the six-figure bonuses. If I'm Prime Minister, I'll take on those energy companies that are ripping you off. If I'm Prime Minister, everyone will play by the same rules. We won't give the green light to tax avoidance. And if I'm Prime Minister, we'll cut the deficit every year, and balance the books, but we'll protect health and education. There is a big choice at this election. I believe that it's when working people succeed that Britain succeeds. If you believe that too, I ask for your support. And let's bring the change that Britain needs. Ed Miliband, thank you very much indeed. Liam Wood. I hope that what you've heard here tonight doesn't fill you with too much despair. Despite what you've heard, there is an alternative to the Westminster consensus in favour of more cuts. Austerity is not inevitable, it's a choice. We can have a future where everyone has access to decent public services, where everyone can have a decent standard of living, but not if we keep doing things the way we always have done. For a stronger, more prosperous, greener Wales, for a Wales that counts, for a devolution and financial settlement that is no longer set second rate, give your vote to Plaid Cymru, the party of Wales. For Wales to be strong, like Scotland, Plaid Cymru must be strong. The more strength you give us, the greater influence we will have. Let us be the success we know we can be. Thank you. Diolch yn fawr. <laughs> Diolch yn fawr. Leanne Wood. Natalie Bennett. If you want change, you have to vote for it. I say vote for what you believe in. You don't have to go on voting for the lesser of two evils. That's how we ended up with the tired, failed politics that we have now. If you want a fair economy, a public NHS, a stable climate, vote for change, vote Green. Already in Parliament, we've seen Caroline Lucas make a huge impact. We need more MPs like Caroline. With a strong group of Green MPs, we can deliver a new kind of politics. You can deliver a peaceful political revolution. Wherever you are, in England, Wales, Scotland or Northern Ireland, if you're thinking about voting Green, do it. Your vote will count. Natalie Bennett, thank you. Nigel Farage. You see, I warned you at the beginning, I said they were all the same. <laughs> and, what you've, and what you've seen tonight is the politically correct political class. Oh, they're very keen to be popular on the international stage. They don't understand the thoughts, hopes and aspirations of ordinary people in this country. They are detached. Most of them have never had a job in their lives. Uh, what we represent in UKIP is plain spoken patriotism. We believe in this country. We believe in its people. We think Britain can be a lot better than this. But if you want things to be shaken up and to change properly, you've got to put more UKIP MPs in Westminster. We won two by-elections last year. We can outshine all expectations on May the 7th. Let's do it. Nigel Farage, thank you. David Cameron. Thank you. I've been your Prime Minister for the last five years, and all that time I've tried to have one task in mind, above all others, and that has been turning our economy around, putting the country back to work, and clearing up the mess that was left to us. I want to stand for another five years because I want us to finish the job that we've all started. We've created two million jobs. Let's create a job for everyone who wants and needs one. We've cut the deficit in half. Let's clear it all together and have Britain back in the black. 
We've invested in our national health service. Let's keep doing that and make sure it's a genuine service seven days a week for you and your family all year round. What my plan is about is basically one word, security. Security for you, for your family, for our country. This is an amazing country and we're on our way back. And there's a fundamental choice at this election. Stick with the plan and with the team who brought that plan because it's working and it's helping or put it all at risk by the people who gave us the spending, the debt, the taxes and the waste. I say, let's stick to the plan that's working. Let's not go back to square one. Let's finish what we started. David Cameron, thank you very much indeed. My thanks too also to Nicola Sturgeon, to Leanne Wood, to Ed Miliband, to Nigel Farage, to Nick Clegg and to Natalie Bennett. It has been a fascinating debate and also a big thank you to all our audience here for all their questions and to you at home for watching and those, of course, who joined us online. Stay with us now on ITV for reaction and analysis on News at 10 and after that, a special debate night edition of The Agenda with Tom Bradby. Thanks again for watching and good night. <laughs>